Good evening, um, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. It's a great honor to have you all here in our midst, particularly in light of the honor we have in tonight's guests. I'm Nairi Woods, I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government, and tonight I would like to pass to introduce our speaker um, to Ike, Ike Bolaji Umukwede, a man who has been described as banker, philanthropist, thinker, who for us in the Blavatnik School is more than anything an African who is passionate about improving public service on his continent, starting first in his own country, Nigeria. And to that end, together with his wife and his colleagues, he has built the Africa Initiative for Governance, a wonderful new organization that as a school we learn from all the time and that's working with us to both to bring brilliant future leaders from West Africa to the school to study on the Master of Public Policy, but also to bring leading practitioners and policy makers to the school, such as Professor Atihiru Jega, who was with us as the AIG Visiting Fellow last year, the Electoral Commissioner who oversaw Nigeria's last election. So, the Africa Initiative for Governance we see as an extraordinarily important initiative and one that the school exists to help support, to help seed in other parts of the world um, and, and to work with in all of our endeavors. So could you welcome with me one of Nigeria's most formidable and best businessmen, but also philanthropists and public servants Aiki Mukwede. Good evening, distinguished audience, uh, and thank you so much, Nairi. I must start by congratulating you. I was reading the newspapers and I read on an honors list. Um, I saw my friend's name and I thought, well, I'm growing up in the world if my friends are now you know, on the honors list. Uh, congratulations, a great year, great way to start the year. Uh, and of, of course to my colleagues on the board and on the panel of advisors of the Africa Initiative for Governance, including the gentleman that I'm privileged to introduce here to you this evening, who will be giving us a very powerful talk and with whom you are free to interact with questions and answers, you know, uh, subsequently. The gentleman I'm privileged to introduce is a man in Africa and actually in a number of forums. So at you know, different times, I've been in rooms across the world where he's been referred to as Baba. And when you refer to a man as Baba, that means that I will not tell you the year he was born. Um, <laughs> but his name is Olushegu Matthew Obasanjo. He's a career soldier who enjoyed the very best training at the most prestigious military schools you can imagine, and whose report cards from those schools, and because of the Freedom of Information Act we have privy to, um, are quite outstanding. Um, and he grew to be the chief army engineer of the Nigerian army. And now it gets more and more interesting because the name Olushegun means God is victorious. Olushagun or Shegun is victorious. And in the life of this gentleman who I'm privileged to introduce today, you will see the hand of God and the resulting victory almost at every turn. He's a highly decorated military officer, serving with distinction both within and outside Nigeria. Um, I guess when you, when you serve in the army and you happen to be the, the colonel who captures Oweri and effectively ends the civil war, and receives the sort of surrender, that's, that's a victorious uh, general or military man. And um, he, he became head of state of Nigeria in 1976, following the, uh, the assassination, unfortunate assassination of uh, our past head of state, General Moritz Mohammed. 
Now take note, he was inducted or, you know, he's, he was a military head of state who did not seek it, did not pursue it through a coup and so on, was invited by his colleagues very reluctantly actually to take on the reins of command in 1976. And he was the first, first military head of state in Nigeria to voluntarily hand over power to a civilian government in 1979. Now, that's enough for any, anybody to live. You know, you fight a war, you win a war, you end up being head of state. Over the period whilst you're head of state, you achieve so much, and um, you are known as the general who loves peace. He went back to his farm. He's also a farmer. And um, he actually, interestingly, brought me as close as you can to, to agriculture. Um, you know, he advised me after the first time I visited his farm wearing a suit, not to come in a suit anymore. Um, uh, and, but in this, in this farm, he didn't leave the world alone. He, along with other past heads of states, um, continued to effect change around the world, speaking truth to power where it was necessary. And in Nigeria, he spoke a bit too much truth to a man in power uh, who chose to, to imprison him unfairly and uh, without reason. Uh, he was confined in prison between 1995 and 1998. And I told you his name means God is victorious. He went from prison to president, literally in the space of one year, out of prison to his farm and then back, you know, into, into, into the Aso Villa in Abuja, having won the presidential election in 1999. And I was driving out of Mao Maison, I think it's the, the former prison, uh, with Chief Obasanjo on the way here. And I said to him, sir, you know this was a prison? I said, yes, I know, I recognize some of these things here. It's like <laughs> <laughs> As Nigeria's president, um, you saw that name, Olusegun, God is victorious at play again, because um, he took Nigeria from ranking as one of the world's worst economies to ranking as one of the world's top performing economies between 1999 and 2007. During that period, we witnessed many revolutions. We witnessed the, what we call the GSM rev revolution. Prior to his presidency, uh, 90 million Nigerians struggled to use 400,000 phones. And um, he introduced the GSM technology into Nigeria through a very transparent auction system that today has seen us go from 400,000 phone lines to over 160 million phone lines for 190 million Nigerians. He introduced the pension revolution, uh, which has led to about 9 million, or between 7 and 9 million Nigerians having pension accounts from under, well under a million Nigerians and well over seven trillion naira in savings mobilized as a result therefrom. He introduced the industrial revolution in Nigeria that has seen Nigeria's cement capacity exceed our domestic consumption, as well as sugar and other, other, other areas. He introduced the institutions that today, um, uh, the EFCC, which is the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to fight corruption. He strengthened the central bank introduce the National Communications Commission. Um, and, well, obviously he didn't do this alone. He has this great knack of spotting great talent and building teams with a sense of purpose. Uh, there's something interesting that I found about his team members. His team members seem to achieve great things when he's president and when they're on their own, they don't do that well. <laughs> but certainly, if there's a man with a track record of building outstanding teams and getting talented Africans to do great things, this is one of them. And he didn't end there. His presidency ended in 19, uh, 2007, sorry. And um, he continued. The world uses him now more than Nigeria uses him, even though from time to time when he, he's a bit uh, 
unhappy with what is happening in Nigeria, he never lacks the courage to see it, speak it, and, and, and walk it. Now, at the grand age of, <coughs> um, uh, he just earned a PhD in Christian theology, which, as I understand, is actually one of the more difficult um, subject matters to pursue a PhD, and I think he deserves a round of applause for that. And also has chosen to join a few um, very intense African men and women who came together to, to form the Africa Initiative for Governors to kind of push the envelope once again and see how we can get talented people working for their governments in Africa so that it's not just the private sector that is benefiting from the great talent that comes from Africa, but also the public sector. And in that capacity, he's the chairman of our panel of advisors, and he has been a wonderful chairman. But this evening, uh, you have the, um, you know, the unique privilege of listening to a great man, a great African, a uh, great statesman of the world, Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, past president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who will speak to us on leadership, transformational leadership in Africa. I've listened to him speak many times, and um, uh, I remember when he, he spoke at this occasion, and I think it was, an, unfortunately, it was a British prime minister who, who was in the audience, and he asked him, why are you not releasing our country's stolen money? Um, and he had no answer. And very soon after, we, we received our money. But uh, so this evening, it's my, my great pleasure and privilege to introduce and to invite to the podium past president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Chief Olusha Gwabasanjo. I thank you very, very much for all those sweet things that you said about me. But you should realize that I do have political adversaries. And if you say all those things in their presence, they won't like you for it. <clears throat> um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me welcome you. But let me uh, crave your indulgence that um, about an hour and a half has been given to this uh, exercise tonight. In that one and a half hours, I was supposed to speak for one hour, which I regard as much, much too much. So what you will understand if I'm short on monologue and long or interaction, which is which will be more beneficial to all of us. Leadership is a subject that is relevant and always topical in any human institution or organization, and more so in the African context of today. This issue of leadership is one that usually poses dilemma to the analyst when it comes to its examination. This is particularly so in that it has a plethora of dimensions. Indeed, the concept of leadership has attracted a lot of scholastic and intellectual attentions, particularly in the quest to define its subject matter and styles. As a matter of fact, even though leadership remains one of the most relevant aspects of any human community, its theory, definition, and styles have been both challenging and varied depending on the situation. I do not intend to go into semantics and details of definition and styles, except to say that the job of any leader is to lead and influence others to do what they have to do for the collective objective willingly to achieve the group or corporate goal. 
leaders don't always function or perform alike. Indeed, no two leaders will do or act exactly in the same way over what needs to be done in any one particular situation. Indeed, today's reflections on Africa elicit both a smack and a grin at the same time, particularly when the world at large and Africa in particular is grappling with twin issues of economic growth and poverty in our continent. For the cynics, on designing and the uninformed, nothing much has changed about the continent. Still a black continent full of monkeys and apes in the street with disease, poverty, and corruption. They are both happy and sad stories to tell about Africa. For the cynics, nothing reflects the African situation more than the desperation of African youth to flee the continent. The phenomenon is sad and tragic. The cynics may be forgiven for their view, but I tell you, it is a manifestation of an old, ever fasting challenge of population management with good governance. But for as long as those who are supposed to act on these issues are on the side of some awkward sentiments of religion, culture, and nature, so long will it be difficult to deal effectively with the issues, including the demography issue. The story of leadership in Africa is not only about missed opportunities or of its many missed starts. Afro-pessimists may as well dwell on these or continue to revel in the often misunderstood jinx of Africa remaining perpetually as, and I quote, the continent of the future. I think Africa's time is now, and the signs are not too difficult to read. However, transformational leadership is required, and it is key. In discussing this idea, or concept, if you will, I should dwell a bit on a historical overview of transformational leadership in Africa, what it means, and I shall also delve a bit into my personal experiences as an active participant in managing transformative change in my own country, Nigeria. Some questions immediately arise. How does the African conceive leadership? Are leaders in Africa conscious of change, transformative change? How have we as leaders in Africa acquitted ourselves in driving transformative change? Are there case studies to drive home these inquisitions? What are the issues and circumstances that hinder such changes and what needs to be done to actualize such changes or sustain them if we already have a modicum of them within the continent? Historically, African leadership was potent and formidable during the pre-colonial era a leadership interwoven with the life of the entire community. People's knowledge of their leader during this period was inalienable and intimate. The leaders themselves had what embedded spiritual dimension that they were God sent and that their act of governance was in accordance with the spirit and letters of their ancestors and the divinities. The period witnessed the golden age of monarchies 
and paramount use on the continent. Colonial, uh, colonialism in the 19th century compelled another kind of leadership for Africa. With the occupation of Africa, direct emasculation of African development, including abuses and atrocities were recorded on the continent perpetrated by the colonial masters. Fired by patriotism and a burning desire to liberate their people from the clutches of imperialism, the African leaders of the colonial period resolved to prosecute an agenda which will bring freedom and egalitarianism to the rank and file of their people. The, colon the colonial African leaders, it must be noted, were not directly at the helm of affairs during the period. They were, at best, at the periphery of power as absolute authority was vested primarily in the colonial masters. The constraints and shortcomings they grappled with during the period, therefore, necessarily had to be secondhand, transferred, or indirect. African leaders of the colonial period, traditional chiefs and nationalists, deserve to be credited for their willpower and doggedness in fighting the cause of freedom and independence for African nations, in spite of the fact that they were not directly within the power corridor. History has recorded their monumental achievements against all odds. They sought for independence and got it by negotiation with some of them imprisoned or dead in the process or by taking up arms with some of them dying also in the process. In addition, and under an ideological pretext, they were pulled together. Uh, they were pulled towards a Western or Eastern ideological magnet, which came with unnecessary weights and vain lenses in the Cold War that they were not part of or had any real uh, attachment to, that they become pawns in the war. These and other circumstances were cast on Africa, its leadership and its people. The implication on leadership and for leadership in Africa was clear. Two years before fortuitous circumstances thrusted leadership on my country, uh, of my country on me in 1974, I was at the Royal College of Defense Studies in London. A considerable part of my stay was spent thinking and meditating at length on the political, economic, and social problems and future of Nigeria. I interacted with colleagues and traveled within Europe and visited Latin America, Australia, and Asia. Thus, when the mantle of leadership fell on me, it was an opportunity to reflect on my thoughts and put them into practical uses. It will be understood why and now we successfully prosecuted an enviable, healthy, and vibrant economic policy, executed a most robust foreign policy, and ended the political aberration called military government in the country in 1979. That opened the floodgates for sweeping spate of democratization across the continent of Africa. It was how we provided leadership for the political transformation at that time. So for me, leadership is reflective, active, and reactive. 
Between 1979 and 1999, I was active in the, in the international scene. It was good interacting and a good experience. It was good interaction and a good experience and a good learning process. That, with prison experience, was a good school for leadership training and preparation for high political office. The three years, three months, and three days I spent in jail following a phantom coup were spent reflecting on how to serve God and humanity. Rather than waiting to come into office to re react, I see the initiative to travel across the globe during the period of my being president-elect. On being sworn in as president, my earlier traveling had created both formal and informal network to build Nigeria out of its barrier state among the Committee of Nations and negotiate debt relief, which we eventually secured. That again to me is how the political leadership can drive transformative change within, uh, within context. You don't wait for disaster to strike before seeking solution. You must be proactive. With some understanding by all of us, I do not wish to theorize on the concept of leadership and how it makes or mass an institution, a people, or an activity. I also make no apologies that Africa may well have been, may well have been caught between the vicissitudes of attempted physical, human, and economic development rigmarole. But the reality today is that at a time, most developed economies are in crisis. A lot of African economies are on the upswing. On the upside, experiences are showing that there is an emerging African leadership that is responding positively to the challenges of today. I remember that while we were inaugurating the African Leadership, Africa leadership Forum, ALF, in 1986, former German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt had averted our minds to the fact that the economic literacy would be a major solution in Africa leadership challenges. On the development plane, experiences since then have shown that some leaders in Africa with modicum of economic knowledge are responding positively to the challenges of leadership in development and economic management. It is not surprising that at the commanding heights of the economy doing well in Africa today are some of the best economic managers who had, who had proven uh, metro in major international financial institutions and focused professionals who, have, uh, who know their onions. The example of Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Côte d'Ivoire are apt. President Alassane Ouattara is focusing on transformative potentials in Côte d'Ivoire with his economic comeback after his election in 2011, which led to death of over 3,000 Ivorians. He has changed the narrative to get ahead of the economic curve by posting a double-digit GDP growth 
exporting electricity to neighboring Ghana and Mali, and exporting processed versions of Ivory Coast's rich raw materials and agricultural produce like cocoa, cotton, rubber, and palm oil, and making his country live with the largest percentage of middle class market in all Africa. The story is the same in many African countries. Over the past decade, six of the world's 10 fastest growing countries were African. In eight of the past 10 years, Africa has grown faster than East Asia, including Japan. Even allowing for the knock-on effect of the Northern Hemisphere's slowdown, the IMF experts, uh, the IMF expects Africa to continue to grow some by as much as of middle to high single digit economic growth and some double digit till most become middle class income by the year 2025. For this to happen, African leaders need to mobilize internal resources for development and encourage direct foreign investment, uh, investment flows. Africa must be able to incentivize 25% of annual global flow of foreign direct investment, which stood at 1,600 billion for 2016. Only 55 billion of that came to Africa. And if we have been able to have a quarter of that, it will have been $400 million. Africa, no doubt, will contend with the competitiveness of globalization. But a more integrated world market must be leveraged to open a wide potential for greater growth, and it presents an unparalleled opportunity for us in developing countries, especially continental Africa, to raise our living standards. Even the most undiscerning observer will agree that the last decade and a half have been principally reasonably different for Africa and Africans. The difference has been leadership to a large extent. We have undertaken far-reaching reforms, which is meant to remove the old order and establish a new order, and which should enable Africa move in tandem with the rest of the world. I was elected as president of Nigeria in February of 1999 and was inaugurated as president in May 1999, when Nigeria was a parallel uh, nation, as I said earlier. Everywhere people had poor opinion about us. We were scorned at and viewed as a liability in the Committee of Nations. The situation demanded that I worked to stave off that perception. As a country under political transformation, I applied myself scrupulously to the task at hand. For the eight years that I served, I reached out to world leaders and continued to do so beyond my presidency. That was termed shuttle diplomacy in governance. I traveled extensively, conversing global understanding and our mainstreaming into the new world order not only for Nigeria, but for the wide, uh, for the whole of Africa. By the time I finished my two terms, I had traveled to 97 countries. Like most social science concepts, in defining and or understanding human endeavor, several elements or factors come together to provide the pillars for transformational leadership. 
In my experience, I should point out a few which were evident as I lived through life and learned from it. They include reflection and engagement, proactivity, shrewdness, and openness to work with others. Perhaps the greater attribute in transformational leadership is not just the ability to engage in personal leadership reviews, but also the ability to attach a formidable level of honesty and knowledge around it. Like I mentioned earlier, my time in the Royal College of Defense Studies in 1974 gave me an opportunity to also reflect on the problems of Nigeria and Africa. It deepened my ideas of leadership and engagement vis-a-vis -vis the senior military role I was to assume after the, uh, the course. When in 1975, I found myself in government as number two in the hierarchy of a military government, I could say I was not absolutely unprepared. So when we were confronted with the problem of internal governance, particularly the issues of the economy, fighting corruption and building cooperation and cohesion within the country, my Royal College of Defense Studies reflective experience became very relevant and valuable. And so it was when we had to deal with the remaining issue of decolonization and removal of apartheid in Africa. Another experience I found useful in my period uh, is my period in the prison. It was isolation, but meditative and reflective, if not very interactive experience. It gave me the opportunity to read, to pray, and to think. And it positioned me to be in a good state of mind when I became the president of Nigeria. It was a sort of silent, silent contemplation. Silence has its usefulness, power, and its reward. Although I will not recommend prison as an ideal place, as an ideal place for leadership, for leadership preparation, but if it has to be, then one must make very good use of it. I have made the point on a number of occasions that my prison experience was sad but beneficial. What I'm saying is that when you find yourself in a position which you do really not want, make the best use of it. Africa needs leadership, and it needs it now and all the time. Proactivity as an element of transformational leadership emphasizes the need for governance to be led actively by a designing and quick thinking leadership. I had the problem of how to put an end to coups when I took over as elected president. I thought about this issue and had come to the conclusion that retiring all officers of the armed forces who had held any political office under the military would go a long way. I made sure that none of the newly appointed service chiefs fell into this category. With that coast cleared and without giving anybody an inkling, I lost no time in exercising my duty as Commander-in-Chief to ask for immediate compulsory retirement of all of them, about 93 officers, subject to formal ratification by the Service Council concerned later. This issue was taken, the decision was taken on a Thursday and it was announced on a Friday so that Saturday and Sunday those officers will have been out of barrack and an officer out of uniform is like fish out of water. <laughs> Again, I should reiterate my experience shortly after I was elected. 
I engage in what may be called shuttle diplomacy in governance. Instead of the going, instead of going uh, cap in hand for do not uh, for do not dictated partnership terms, that often saw our leaders accepting all manners of conditionalities. The lesson here is that proactive leadership was critical at the time in Nigeria's history. I commenced the campaign for debt relief early in my first term and got sympathetic hearings, but not much action from political leaders of creditor countries. After my first term, I realized that my talks at the highest political level needed follow-up at the levels below. So, I had hunted Ngozi Kunju Iwala from the World Bank, appointing her as Nigeria's Minister of Finance. The plan for bringing Ngozi in was that she would follow up at a lower level after I had secured understanding at the political level, uh, political leadership level. Even then, the fact that Nigeria was the sixth largest oil producing country in the world was regularly used as the reason to deny debt relief. I will then explain that Nigeria's population of about 150 million at the time now running to about 200 million, and each stage of development should justify such relief. Ultimately, the Paris Club creditors gave us a debt relief of about $18 billion, and we paid up about $12 billion to rid ourselves of the debt burden. The lesson, again, is that transformational leadership upholds complacency. It requires proactivity, thinking out of, uh, out of the box, resilience, and consistency. African leaders are becoming more strategic, open, and liberal-minded. We no longer take no for an answer. And Nelson Mandela will say, as Nelson Mandela will say, and I quote, it always seems impossible on it until it is done. We must maintain vigilance for pursuing adopted objectives, even when they look like a waste of time. An example of this element saw our creation of excess crude account, which at that time meant saving excess revenue and channeling them towards critical development goals. Shrewdness in policy development and creative, implement and creative implementation is a virtue that must not be ignored. Transformational leadership is not a popularity context. It cannot pretend to be. It must do what it has to do. When it has to do it, and without failing. You must be seen to be honest with others, and they must see palpable honesty, integrity, and ethics in you for them to do your bidding and give you their trust and confidence. And this was what you find in our debt relief management. When the international community knew that we were serious with our reform efforts, they cooperated and became very responsive and helpful. In conclusion, good governance is the byproduct of good leadership. And good governance is unequivocally germane for development in all ramifications of human life, dignity, and quality of existence. There's no substitute for dialogue. In terms of face-to-face -face and eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball discussions and negotiations for understanding an effective result. Therefore, if Africa is to be relevant in global division of labor, 
global decision making and competitiveness, its leaders need to wake up to the clarion call of positive developmental paradigm shift that will significantly benefit the African continent and humanity globally. Of significant importance is the performance of all sectors of the entire national life, such as the private sector, the academic, the civil society, the religious and financial institutions, market women, youth, and even ordinary farmers. All hands must be clean, efficient, effective, productive, progressive, and on deck, performing well with one objective, making Africa the, the continent of the 21st century. Whatever any human being anywhere can do, an African can do it, given the same opportunity. That is my belief and my philosophy. Africa does not need to be where it is if African leaders have chosen the right option. But better late, however, than never. This could mean a total cognitive re-engineering that will evolve a change of attitude and approach to leadership and governance at all levels and in all walks of life. The knowledge age poses an additional challenge to African leaders of today. To claim this 21st century for Africa, the key is leadership. That leadership can be both a learning experience and a practice in the act of self transcendence transcendency with the advantage of hindsight. My commitment to the model of leadership helped me to appreciate the importance of formalizing a structure to institutionalize the memory of my service for posterity. Within the framework of the Olusek Mobasanjo Presidential Library, we aspire not just to pay tribute to the past, but also to add value to a spectrum of undertakings which seek to evolve a homegrown architecture to help, and I quote, fire the imagination of young African leaders as Nigeria's first president, Dr. Nandi Asikwe once observed. It is not all an unmitigated failure. We have, we have some oases in the desert, but we need critical mass sustainably and continually. I am optimistic that the 21st century can be the century of Africa. My confidence springs from what I see of up and coming young African leaders. We just have meetings with some of them, which is inspiring and which fills me with hope for the future. I am inspired by their can-do spirit, their enthusiasm, dynamism, inquisitiveness, and ready-to-go attitude, as if to say, where past generations fail, we will succeed. I thank you for listening. Chief Obasanjo has very kindly agreed to take questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, can you put up your hand? Do briefly tell us who you are and um, and then an even briefer question. So, over this side. <clears throat> Sir President, thank you for being here. Uh, I am Andres, I come from Colombia, and one of the... I by you, by you, so that I can hear. Yes. Give me that paper. 
Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is, in countries such as Nigeria and Colombia, there are multiple international actors which try to impose development or economic models in our countries. So in your opinion, countries such as Nigeria or Colombia should imitate successful models of development or on the contrary, build their own models based on the specific characteristics of the country? So, yeah, so that every, I know the, it, the sound over here is, is, is bad, so I will just briefly summarize the question for you each time. But um, should a country like Nigeria try to carve its own model, or should it try to copy other countries that have been okay. successful? I'll take, we'll take three we'll, questions. We'll, we'll take about three, then. My name is Fola Bijimo. I'm in African Studies. And my question to you, sir, um, speaks directly to your theme, transformational leadership. I have always believed that Africa doesn't have development problem, it has leadership problem. Now, in hindsight, given the fact that a key component of a transformational leadership is being able to choose a successor that will carry on the dream and the transformation, and in hindsight, if you were given a second chance, would you have chosen President, uh, late President Umaru Musa Yaradua as your successor? So the question there was a key role of leadership is to choose your successor or to groom your successor. President Obasanjo's reflections on this have been asked for. Could we, could we come over to there, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Nolianga Imasuku, and I'm Zambian, doing the MPP. So my question is, one of Africa's biggest problems is corruption, but then people around tend to feel there's nothing they can do because of the immunity of the people within the big house. So I was wondering, coming from the big house itself, what is the loophole that we are not seeing where we can fight corruption from the outside? So that, that question, just for our audience over there, was how do you fight corruption um, in, in Nigeria? Where, where is the loophole? Thank you very much. Uh, let me deal with these three questions. Um, should Nigeria develop its own uh, model of uh, development or copy a successful one. Uh, once you are out of the ideological mold of uh, whether you are a communist or capitalist, uh, I, I think the rest is you have to do what you really find is in your best interest. Um, because there is really nothing other than what is best for you. And um, let me take Nigeria for instance. We, even the two political parties we have now, somebody said they are the same, one and the same. So there's no ideological difference. There's no nothing that you will say. In fact, some people go from one party and then when they cannot get space in that, they go to the other one. When they cannot get space in that, they go back to the other one. Um, but for me, the point is that what do we really want? How do you cater for the welfare and the well-being of our people? Let me give an example. Today, our population is about 200 million. By the year 2045, we will be about 400 million. Now, if we have trouble today handling education, employment, and all that for 200 million, and about 80% of those 400 million in the year 2045 will be living in cities, how do we handle 400 million less than 35 years from now? Now, if we know how to handle that, 
then I will say we are on the way. We are doing the right thing. Whichever way, whichever model we use to uh, handle that. But do we? And if we don't, then calamity, disaster is there ahead. And we must avoid that. So I will say, yes, if you look at something, what is one particular country doing that you can do, which will serve your purpose? Or what is one particular country doing that you shouldn't do because it will be inimical to your uh, interests and your purpose? I, I, I will say that is what matters. Um, so if in that way you want me to be, uh, to say, well, Nigeria should copy what is good and then uh, develop what is in its own best interest. Now, the next question is, uh, how do I choose my predecessor? L let me tell you the experience I have seen in Nigeria. I don't know of other, uh, other countries. You can never know what somebody will do until he's in a leadership position. You can never. When he's in leadership position, that is when you can say yes. And um, there's an old saying in my own part of the world that now you will never know what a man will do until he's either in leadership position or is a very rich man. Now, that's why in all, another part of my, uh, my, 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 my world, they say the two should not be in the hand of one man. Leadership and money. So uh, they say God doesn't give the two together. Because if God gives the two together in one man's hand, he will be, it will be tyranny. So um, you ask, will I take Yaradwa? With what I knew about Yaradwa before I appointed him or before I selected him, if that is what I will, I will know next time around, I will still appoint him. But let me tell you the stories that I had. When Yaradua got there, the first thing that happened was some people went to him and said, look, unless you pull Obasanjo down, you will never be able to go up. So he believed that. So his first uh, uh, task was how to pull Obasanjo down. And he tried that, he did not succeed. Unfortunately, maybe if, I, if he has lived long, uh, long enough, he might have succeeded. Um, uh, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can never be too sure. Um, the one that came after him, um, what we thought was that he would be better. And then he was not better. But, but let me tell you, the beauty and that is the thing which you all uh, um, be happy about. The beauty of democracy is when you have a situation like that, you can peacefully set them aside. And we have achieved that in Nigeria. And in fact, in other parts of Africa. So if you have a successor or a leader who you thought will do, do uh, perform well, and he fails to perform well, then democracy means that you can take him out. We have done that, and uh, why can't we do it again? If the position, uh, if, if the same um, situation occurs, I see that as the way uh, to go. Now, how do we fight corruption? Corruption is a hydra-headed monster. And it is very deeply rooted. And those who are corrupt, what they normally do is they, they, you find a regime that is fighting corruption. They lie low until that regime packs up. And then they go, you have a regime that is not very strong in fighting corruption. They befriend that regime. And that has always been the situation. So fighting corruption is not a one-night uh, um, uh, 
deal. It's not even a one regime or deal. It's not a two regime or deal. It must be a, con a continually. And um, I believe in the case of Nigeria, we have in place all the um, instruments to fight corruption. We have the EFCC, we have the ICPC, we have uh, code of conduct, the, the, the institution that will regulate certain things uh, that will make you uh, behave. We have one that we call, um, uh, what is that one? The uh, one um, that will make you do things according to, uh, according to the way it should be done. What do you call it? Due process. Yeah, we, thank you very much. We, we call it due process. It's actually that it m makes you do things the way it should be done um, and all that. But all those can be undermined. They can, all, they can be frustrated, they can be undermined, and we have seen that. So what is the way to fight corruption? The first thing is that the man at the top must be ready to fight corruption. And he must be like Caesar's wife, above board. Then the people around him must be people that are as clean as he himself must be. Then there are certain heads of institutions, government institutions, your police, your custom, your uh, legislative assembly, your judiciary. These are, uh, if you are the head of government, you are clean and not corrupt, and these others are not clean and they are corrupt, you will be there alone and you won't achieve much. So fighting corruption is an endless exercise and it must be taken seriously by every regime. But the instrument for doing it, I believe in the case of Nigeria, we have all of it in place. We have all of it in place. Fantastic. More, one, another round of questions. So let's start right at the back. Thank you. My name is Alexander Dufo, and I'm in the School of Geography. I, I'd like to take my uh, question on the uh, corruption angle you talked about. Um, your administration is on record to have done substantially very well in fighting corruption in Nigeria. Uh, with respect to EFCC and how you, and correct me please, how you handpicked Nuhu Rebadu. Um, over time, after you had left, I know there were issues with him and he had to be sidelined. Um, from hindsight, would you again um, go through the same process of selecting this man um, to to do the work or you probably would have done it differently to the extent that after you had left, um, the, the, the work would have been ongoing. And from where you stand now, how do you assess the impact you made with respect to EFCC and what is being done with respect to EFCC's effectiveness currently? And finally, how um, were you, when you were in the military school, were you thinking of becoming the president of Nigeria someday? Thank you. We'll take, we'll take three. That was, a, that, was a, that was three all in one, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> Hydra headed, I think. <laughs> yeah. My name is Tendai. I'm from Zimbabwe. And the reason why I came is for you to help me understand the situation in Zimbabwe. And considering that you've both been a military head of state and, and, and a civil head of government, um, they said it was a coup. And, uh, no, they said it wasn't a coup, but it had all the signs of a coup. And now we see the military, they are taking off uh, their uniforms and they are being given positions in government. So what is it? Are they leaving their military mindset and taking on a different mindset? 
I, I would love for you to just give us wisdom of how to understand and how to move on as Zimbabweans. Great. So our first question was about corruption after the Obasanjo um, era. The second question is, please help me understand Zimbabwe. Is that a coup or is that not a coup? And over right. here. And one question. Hello, my name is Artwell. I'm from Oxford. Last year at the Oxford African History Celebration, we selected Nigeria to look at governance, how to look at nation building in Africa. We asked the question, what can we learn about nation building in Africa from looking at Nigeria's post-colonial governments? And I'd like to know if you agree with us. It was a fan fascinating look at Nigeria. And we concluded that Nigeria, so long as the wealth of Nigeria is in the hands of so few people, that the prospect is not going to be good. I wonder if you would agree with our assessment. Thank you. So there the question was, nation building in Nigeria, does the distribution of wealth in the country make it impossible? Let's take one, one more question, just right here, trying to take people at the front as well. Yeah, my name is Namonso Ekane. I'm a senior advocate of Nigeria. I practice in Nigeria. Uh, my question is, respectfully, sir, you said that whilst in prison, you reflected on the position, you had reflections. My question then is, did you reflect on this petroleum problem? fuel problem in Nigeria. And when you came in, sir, did you do something about it? And if you reflected on it and were not able to do something about it when you were there, what would you suggest they do while they're there now? Thank you. Thank you. So that, that fourth question was the petrol problem, as you put it, in Nigeria and whether you would do things differently. And there was one question, sir, uh, earlier on, which, which was whether you, did you think of being president when you were in military school? Okay, <laughs> military school, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Okay, uh, the first one is corruption after a passenger. Um, I, I have emphasized corruption must be consistently fought. Now, when, and you, you are right, there were two people that I specially picked because of their track record and what we knew about them. One was uh, uh, Justice Akambi, who was appointed to head ICPC. That was the first organization, the anti-corruption the other one was uh, Nuhu Ribadu. I did very meticulous um, background check of these two. Now, when, uh, and I've said this publicly, uh, Buhar, um, sorry, um, Ribadu was so effective that they made attempt on his life. He was poisoned. Uh, he, he survived it, we were, we were lucky. Now, when uh, Yaradua took over, he decided to dismantle a number of things as part of his program to pull Obasanjo down. And the unfortunate thing, or whatever, is that uh, Nuri Badu was one of those that he decided he must pull down. So. He dealt with uh, uh, Ribadu, although Ribadu had a tenor, um, but if you are president and you want to do what is even not absolutely right, uh, you can do it and you may or may not get away with it. He did it and got away with it. 
Now, when Ribadu was removed, the man who started looking for successor for Ribadu was James Ibori. James Ibori picked uh, uh, Mrs. Waziri, is it? Huh? Yes. And if Ibori, who has just completed his prison term uh, in this country for corruption, has to be the one to look for successor for Buhari, uh, for Nuhu uh, Ribadu, uh, you know what that means. I don't think I need to say more than that. Um, Zimbabwe, is it a coup or not a coup? <laughs> I think what has happened in Zimbabwe is an indication that some of the measures of the African Union is working. Because in the Constitutive Act of African Union is that if you come into government unconstitutionally, then you will not, you will be kicked out of the African Union. And you saw the way it was done with, against Egypt. Um, and I think the first country where that was done uh, was Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so Zimbabwe didn't want that. So what did they do? They removed government through a coup. But they then use the same method to make sure that the man who should have succeeded, the man removed, was sworn in as successor, which is semi legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, of course, haven't got him in. There must be uh, a deputy. And the uh, head of the armed forces who carried out the coup was appointed as deputy. Again, in uh, the way he, 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 he retired from the army and he was uh, appointed. Now, so you say, is it a coup or not a coup? It's uh, a semi-coup. <laughs> <laughs> Nation building in Nigeria, will distribution of wealth help or hinder? If distribution of wealth you are talking about is distribution of wealth as we have it under the ground or on the ground, um, I don't see why that should really be uh, a hindrance, um, quite honestly. But if distribution of uh, wealth is in terms of what individuals have, even that, uh, I, I will not say should hinder our uh, uh, nation building uh, process. Um, I, I believe the, 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 the wealth that God has endowed us with, we haven't managed it well. Now, if we manage it well, uh, we can achieve much better than we have achieved. Now, those who are fairly uh, and uh, who have acquired wealth. I wouldn't worry about that. Now, for me, let us have more Nigerian billionaires, and at the appropriate time, let us make them either willingly, voluntarily, spread their own wealth, or if they fail, government should make them spread it. Uh, that, that, that would be uh, and that has nothing to do with uh, 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 nation building or no nation building. Um, 
petrol, I think you are talking about the recent, I don't know whether we are out of it yet, the recent queue at petrol stations is going down, all right? Now, I ask people who are in NMPC, why this? The first thing they said is, oh, it's some independent uh, petrol dealers who thought that they will, uh, that government will hike the price and who are uh, um, hoarding. But that is not true. It is just poor management. And should, what do I think? I think it's incompetence, which is a reflection on the government, as pure and simple. Now, did I ever think of becoming president when I was in school? Whichever school I've been, I never thought of becoming president. Never, it never occurred to me. In fact, the training here in Britain for us in the military is that military should have nothing to do with politics. Um, and, and that was what we uh, uh, learned and what we practiced. Now, I was drafted into uh, uh, military government and um, it's because I didn't believe in it, that's why the plan we made to hand over um, to an elected government, even when my immediate successor uh, was killed in a, in an abortive coup, I made sure that that plan was carried out. And um, I did not flinch on that plan. Um, and later on, when I was put in jail uh, and I came out and people wanted me to be uh, elected president, the first question is I asked them is, how many president do you want me to be? But um, um, it turned out that they wanted me to be, and God wanted me to be. So I was. Will you take two more? Or? Well, two more. Just two yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> right. So two more questions. One here. Yeah, right here. Yeah. Castle, sir. Um, my name is El Nathan Wang. I'm from the Plateau in Nigeria. I'm medical, a student of medical genetics and genomics. Um, one of the th things that I have observed in my short years of life is that in your younger days, a lot of you went and became um, leaders at um, very tender ages, basically. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of the recent um, Not Too Young to Run bill and legislature which is running through so far. Um, my question is, what is, from your wealth of experience, what is it that the youths or the young people are, especially in Nigeria, what are they not doing right for them to, um, because it's, there's a strong desire to get to positions like yours, but they definitely lack something. So my question is, in your own opinion, what do you think they lack? And what do you think is, uh, what do you think is um, the scientific hope for Nigeria, basically, especially in areas of genetics, research, and development, different areas like that? Thank you. So two, two questions there. One, um, what do the Nigerian youth need to do better? And I think implicitly, if you're a young Nigerian, how do you become a leader? I think that was there. <laughs> and um, second, Nigeria's future in, you're a, you're, a, you're a genetic specialist, so in genetics and science. Question over here, the lady in the white shirt. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. Um, you spoke briefly in your lecture about how during the Cold War many developing states were used as pawns in the hands of the superpowers um, and there's a lot of debate and talk going on now about the rise of China and I have a special interest in China and I wanted to ask what your opinion is on China's influence in Nigeria at the moment and many people are happy about the fact that the loans and the aid they give is relatively unconditional but is there any need for us to be skeptical or should we be skeptical about this aid or um, sponsorship being used um, in the near or distant future? Great, so China, your view on China and its relationship with Nigeria. 
And if I can add one final question, Chief of Asanjo, um, it, it is, it's quite simply, when you look back over the last um, two decades, what is your biggest disappointment um, for Nigeria and what is your most positive surprise when you look at your country? When, you, when I think of you elected president, you know, you're there in office in 2000. Now when you look back, what might be the biggest disappointment and what might be the, the biggest positive surprise? Thank you. Let, let, let me deal with the one about youth. <clears throat> Almost anywhere I go, Nigerian youth ask this question. And what I get out of it is that they want to have leadership on a platter of gold. I, I think that should not be the way. In fact, on one occasion, I said that, look, those people who are there may not want to willingly leave. Don't kill them. <laughs> but I said, look, if I sit down and there are two youth on my right, two youth on my left, and two youth behind me, and they start squeezing me, I will soon become uncomfortable. I will leave the place for them. Now, my daughter in front here is shaking her head, saying no. Now, if you want me, you want to take over from me at home, let's go and sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, but on a serious note, I believe that the youth should have as much opportunity as everybody else. I had a, 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 a program recently, uh, Dele, is it? I, I, as a young man, he's um, a, a, a comedian. Dele is a comedian. He came to me and um, now we were joking and I said, look, Dele, uh, Dele is, I will be around 35. And I said, Daily, you are my president. And I didn't know it was recording. And uh, the thing went uh, over. But, and I meant it. Why shouldn't Daily aspire? Um, or any uh, of Daily's uh, age or... Now, there are things that limit the... What a young man can at, uh, uh, attain. One is the amount of money that has come into politics. It is obscene. I, I don't know of other countries, but I understand that it's happening almost in all the countries in West Africa. I don't know of other parts of uh, Africa. It's obscene. And that, something has to be done about it. Otherwise, all the people that will be in politics will be people either sponsored by rich people, godfathers, or people who have stolen money and then used the money to bring themselves into government. Or even uh, drug uh, traffickers, like we have had. Some of them are now in the Senate. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so that must not be allowed. So, but what really I, I believe that youth, and you have the power, because you are the largest in number. Women, they are the largest in number. If you do not pull your power together, then you will not make it. You have to find a way of pulling your power together. And if you pull your power together, you will make it. You will make it. The second of the uh, second is uh, China and Nigeria. I see when I go, come here or go to the U.S., 
they ask me a question. Hey, how are your new colonial masters doing? <clears throat> and I say, who are they? They say the Chinese. I say, oh, well, if the Chinese are our colonial masters, because they are doing business with us and we are doing business with them, why are they not the colonial masters of America? Because the Chinese are holding the largest amount of American treasury bills. And if they throw that uh, 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 American treasury bills into the market, Americans' economy will be affected, adversely affected. If they are not America's colonial master, why should they be ours? Now, and what I say is this, I cherish and we cherish our friendship with the West, good. In fact, we use the same language. We can communicate easily uh, with a country like here. We even use your law. So it should be no problem at all to continue to do business. But if I have an old friend, I should hold on to my old friend, but my old friend should not prevent me from making new one. So if the Chinese have to be my new friend, what should it be your problem? Provided I maintain my friendship with you. It should be your, your problem should be to make sure that you strengthen my friendship with you so that the, uh, my friendship with uh, China will not adversely affect my friendship with you. And that is the way I see that. China and uh, Nigeria, there's nothing different between China and Nigeria and China and the US or China and Britain or China and Germany. Disappointment and surprise. I think you say the last 20 years. I think my disappointment in the last 20 years is the fact that after I left government, which of course um, is constitutional and I was delighted and happy, I was hoping that those who are coming after me will at least, I don't expect them to perform 100%, will at least perform 75% to continue what, where we left. That has not happened. So I feel disappointed by that. What is my surprise? Oh, my surprise is that Nigeria still remains a solid one country. When I was coming into government in 1999, some people said to me, you will be the last president of Nigeria because after you, Nigeria will break up or during your regime. And therefore, there will never be a second president of Nigeria after you. Well, after me, there have been three presidents of Nigeria, and there will continue to be presidents of Nigeria. Whether they perform well or not perform well, that will be a question. And those who perform well, we will give them a colleague. Those who fail to perform well, we will show them the door. So as simple as that. So. <clears throat> Well, you've, you've already started. I, I have three uh, thank yous to give this evening. One, of course, first and foremost to Chief Obasanjo for a long trip and an incredibly enriching lecture and questions and answers for us. You've given us a very special opportunity to talk with you 
and we're all very grateful for that. So can we, can we re-thank Chief Obasanjo? My second thanks are to Mr. Aiki Mokwede and to his board, the board of the Africa Initiative for Governance. Could you stand? Could the board members of, could Aiki Mokwede and the board members of the, and can we thank them? <laughs> thank you for making tonight possible. Um, and thank you to those who have traveled with Chief Obasanjo, including Funke, his daughter, who's here with us this evening, for joining us for this event. And finally, heartfelt thanks from everyone in the room to the staff of the Blavatnik School, the events and facilities staff, who've done such a lovely job to make this happen tonight. So thank you all. If I could ask one final favor of you all, it's could you remain seated so that, we, so that I can take His Excellency um, um, to, to the lifts before you start moving around, and then please feel free to jump up and, and collect your belongings and, and leave. But thank you very much. <laughs>